from Sunset Beach, Hawaii, weighing 267 pounds, the Magnificent Morocco. Why is it they call him Magnificent? The man who lifts condominiums off his chest. Anything that's explosive, anything that's exciting, Prince of Darkness, Master of Destruction, perpetrator of violence. Get ready! I'm going to burn this place down! Hello everybody and welcome to the very first episode of Don Morocco's Magnificent Podcast. And with me, of course, the star of the show. I'm going to throw it to him right now with his shades on in the morning. Here he is, Don Morocco, the Magnificent One. How are you doing? Hello from Sunset Beach. How are you doing? I'm uh, drunk. No, I'm not drunk. I'm all right. I'm, uh, I've only had one <laughs> half glass, so I'm good. But how are you, more importantly? And you're, you're ready for the first of a, 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 new, uh, a new show. Yeah, launching a, uh, launching a new new venue here <laughs> a little uh, different format and hopefully we can uh entertain some people and uh inform and entertain as well well uh, one of the things that i noticed and also i'm doing a bit of an introduction here but uh, apart from this i'm going to be out of the way because my role is maybe to ask some questions and then shut up because nobody wants to hear what i've got to say and rightly so everyone wants to hear what don wants to say and um <laughs> you're on my show uh, the youtube show a few weeks ago and everyone was saying like what an incredible memory you have for all this and almost you're just like a historian of the business and you've got knowledge locked away that needs to get out so uh apart from uh what we're going to do in the uh intro with the news uh we're going to go on to your one of your best friends in the business the master prankster and it's all of course uncle fuji yeah you gotta be well before alzheimer's totally sets in yeah <laughs> so that's the spirit. Well, I thought we'd do a, a little something different, and if it doesn't work out, we'll just cut it, obviously. But I thought I'd ask a couple of news stories. So, um, a couple of things that I thought I'd throw to you, and this is also old news. I don't suppose you saw, and I actually brought this up to you last time I spoke to you, uh, that the Supreme Court has got rid of uh, the final appeal from uh, the Greek guy, Constantine Kairos, with the uh, concussion lawsuit against WWE. Uh, mm -hmm. any, any real opinions on that, I suppose, because your name wasn't on that list originally and now it's been whittled down to five and now it's been thrown out entirely. Uh, it's kind of a grab, you know, you know, you know, it's your, it's like, uh, you know, soccer player suing for, you know, bad knees or bad hips and it comes with the territory, you know, I, I, you know, I understand. And there's a lot of uh, resentment against Vince McMahon, but he, he he he's not the beginning and ending for professional wrestling. And guys are in there, and you know you kind of take care of yourself, you know. And um, you know to hold somebody responsible for it, I, I, yeah. I, I I didn't uh, I didn't sign on to any of that. I uh, it was my you know everything I did was my doing. I believe you know the things happen. Accidents happened and things like, you know, stuff happened. But as far as, you know, putting the blame on somebody else or as a, you know, you know, you're going night after night and the different types of abuse that you take or put your body through. So that's, you know, it's, uh, it was a grab, you know, and, and uh, you know, people may believe, may honestly believe that uh, what they're fighting for, you know, hopefully they do if they're going on on a limb that they, they believe that uh, it's a, uh, a just cause but it didn't uh, it didn't work for me personally well um he's been stuffed with uh five hundred thousand dollars worth of uh <laughs> sanctions quite possibly that he's gonna have to pay as well so it was a bit of a punt on his part and now he's got half a million in debt yeah too bad huh for these lawyers oh you know, they... one less lawyer in the world eh uh the only other thing yeah. <laughs> i was going to bring up to you is i don't suppose you watch dark side of the ring yeah sure do uh, and it was a kicked off season three, and it was uh, a double episode with Brian Pillman. Uh, I don't suppose you ever met Brian Pillman, did you? Or have you got? Any I opinions? did. I did. I met him. Uh, I was uh, out of the WWF, WWE, and I was going. I, I went up to Calgary to. Um, I took the title up there from I think it was Mockin Singh or Bastion Booger, whoever, whatever his name is, Mockin Singh was uh, who he was uh, wrestling as, as, at the time. And um, I took the title there and I was going to switch it over to Davy Boy a, a couple of months or so later. 
So I, I was I spent um, I spent a couple of weeks here and there in in the Calgary territory, and it was I think Stu was still around, and um, I got to meet him there, and, and you know did, didn't uh, didn't know him well, but you know met him, and he was you know I was pretty well as as the story documented, he's a hell of an athlete, hell of a performer. I think his uh, his catch was at the beginning what, what got him and uh, got him from ECW with uh, Paulie Heyman. He'd get on, they'd do the interviews or the the live, live. they didn't they didn't carry it a lot on the show, I guess because they don't, but he'd, get, he'd do the live, uh, you know, live interviews and stuff and he'd, and he'd swear and, you know, get real vulgar and stuff. And that was, you know, his, uh, like a shocking point for, you know, that was his, uh, as far as I know. So, you know, start, aside from being, you know, tremendous performer. I, 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 it blew my mind him working with the, with the, with the, the pins and the rods and stuff in his legs. And yeah, you know, it was just, uh, that, that I didn't understand, you know, it's possessed and going home and sticking the IV back in and wow, he was, uh, he was committed. Yeah. Some people overcommitted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you um, did you ever work with him and uh, Bruce Hart at the time when you were in Stampede? Yeah, I don't think so. I was um, uh, no, I don't. I, it could be. I don't, you got any matches? <laughs> I, I, I wrestled. I wrestled so many guys. You know, I don't. Uh, I, I don't think so. I was pretty much primarily there for for Davy. I went up and Davy uh, Davy and. Uh, I think Dynamite was booking Calgary at the time, so I was there uh, before one of the and and with um, the younger Stu Stu Hart, the the younger son. Well, I went to Japan with him. Uh, I knew him before I knew Brett. Hmm. Is that Owen? Sorry. No, Owen's the youngest. This was uh, oh god, it would be a, uh, Stu. Yeah, they called him Stu too. He was, I know they came from a rough family because we were in Japan, they'd have us, so we, you know, we're not naturally on tour. So we went in the morning, they had a breakfast for us. So they'd probably, you know, it was like seven o'clock in the morning we went in. So they're probably up four or five o'clock in the morning preparing them, preparing them. And it was, egg, you know, fried eggs and the eggs are colder than, colder than ice. And he just, <laughs> you know, sat down and, I, you know, everybody else passed on it. You know, he just, he ate him, didn't say a word, not a complaint. <laughs> you can tell he came from a big family. <laughs> yeah, if you don't eat quick, you don't eat Bruce, at all. Bruce Hart, Bruce Hart. Bruce Hart. Okay, sorry, Bruce Hart. I'll tell you what, we're going to leave that there because uh, this actually might be the basis of another episode as you're running Stampede and all the hearts and everything. But we're going to go to, and I'll explain what we're going to do first, and we're going to dedicate every show here to one personality or one event or one happening, basically. And, of course, who else could it be for the very first episode than Uncle Fuji, Master Fuji himself? And the first question I've got for you is, where do you first meet Fuji? Oh, God. Uncle Harry, not Uncle Fuji. It's Uncle Harry. Because <laughs> his name was Masa Harry Fujiwara. And uh, it was uh, Waikiki Dean Higuchi Dean Ho. The tag, he was tag team partners with the Guria, I think. And he had a, a gym in Waikiki. Uh, and I had hip surgery as a kid, blah, 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 blah. So coming out about uh, 12, 13 years old, I started working out down down there as I couldn't participate in active you know, live sports and stuff. And I wanted to be, and I couldn't surf yet. So I, I, I started working out there and all the wrestlers used to come through. And Fuji was, uh, they, he broke in there he broke in in Hawaii as a uh, as a local guy, a local wrestler. So he didn't, you know, obviously he wasn't getting any he wasn't getting any breaks. He had a good uh, he did, it was a gimmick, but a, an aluminum siding business going. And he well, at first when I first knew him, he was a he was a security guard at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. And he and his partner at night, he and his uh, his partner turned up uh, ran a lot of stuff in Hawaii, but I guess they were. They were walking out with clothes racks of, of uh, shirts and stuff from, you know, the fine the fine uh, shopping shopping uh, shopping stores and and, and buying you know 
at night. He was uh, less of a sleep. But he used to work out at the gym there, at, at Dean's gym. And he'd come by, you know, and he always had, even in those days, he always had a big uh, a big car, Cadillac or big Lincoln, big big car that he'd, that he'd drive and always, uh, always shining. Uh, he's always into, always into mischief. You know, always into, I remember he and, he and Dean one time where they're, they're trying to, trying to steal a, a motor off a boat uh, and it was parked up around the side or back to behind the gym. So Dean had all the the wrenches and the the, the ratchets and stuff there to, to take his uh, food. She said, I'm going to go this, you know, if anybody comes by, you know, you see somebody walking by, whistle. <laughs> he goes and I guess he's taking the motor off the boat and doing as people are walking back and forth. And, it's food. I thought you were going to win. She says, I don't know how to whistle. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's pretty much it. And then the thing with uh, Snooker, he used to work out there too. He was uh, a Mr. Hawaiian Islands. He was a bodybuilder, obviously, you know, by the looks of him. But he used to drive a, he used to drive a, I told this story many times, but he drove a, he drove a liquor dis- distribution. Johnson and Busher, a uh, guy was a classmate of mine. Henry Busher, Johnson and Busher uh, distributed uh, distribution. They, they just this uh, liquor to all the liquor stores in Hawaii, around Hawaii. So Jimmy used to drive. Had a big one of those big uh, liquor stores with beer and booze and stuff on it. And he'd park uh, during his lunch break. He'd leave the keys in the car in his truck, big truck, you know, big delivery truck. He'd leave the keys and go inside, work out for an hour, hour and a half. Came out one day and the truck is gone. They'd stole it and take it to Coolio. And unloaded all the booze and all everything else into his friends. Uh, he had a gym over there, and then Jimmy came out there looking for his truck. His truck was stolen. <laughs> but that's you know that's the Fuji I, I grew up knowing before he was uh, crowned king of the rivers in the business. After <laughs> what year? What year are we talking around here? Oh my God! Six sixty four. 63. So that's about was, the year we broke in. I was, young. I, was, I was young when I went to, uh, started in Dean's. I was in, in uh, junior high. I don't know what you'd call it there, but <laughs> everybody was in junior high. Maybe it was before my high school years. That I knew that's, <laughs> so, so, that's for, the first, so Fuji is basically a um, burglar. Was that just like strictly a burglar or was he into was any other capers? I do that was just a side. Uh, <laughs> he did. That, he just did that for fun. I think you know, just to just to aggravate people. You know, he, he had his hand in everything. He said the aluminum siding business was a big gimmick. He said, but he's making good money. He he before he even got in the business, he'd take the you know, like the guys we would uh, <laughs> Hawaii Honolulu, this, the territory of Hawaii. They, they on Wednesdays they had a either a local show was a civic auditorium, which was the 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 hub. That's where all the original you know the sports uh, indoor sports at the time in the fifties and sixties came from. It was so he uh, they wrestled there on every Wednesday night, and then on a Saturday and Sunday they they were the the military bases, which are you know 20, 30 miles outside of Honolulu. Not you know, not a long trip. So he'd tell the guys, and he'd have his big cars. Well, we're going to, we're going to Schofield tomorrow, so we got to leave. You know, it's leave. Well, it's a long trip. We got to, you know, get ready about ten o'clock in the morning. So he'd take the guys and fill up, and they'd, they'd drive all back and forth across the island, and you know, have, have them buy lunch and beer and everything else, and load the cooler full of beer and poo-poos or you know stuff you eat on the you know to eat with the to come back home. And after the matches were finished, everybody loaded in the car. Fifteen minutes later, he, he drops them off at the hotel. Tells them, "See you later." And drives away. <laughs> Aaron Le- uh, Anton Leone did that to me one time in San Francisco. So I knew it was coming down. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was pretty well. I was prepared. <laughs> Do you know, um, Mr. Fuji, when he actually got into the business, he was one of many Hawaiian natives that was portrayed as Japanese, although you can see in his face, you know. Uh, but, um, I, I mean, even wrote a list, like there was Yokozuna, obviously Tosh Togo, who was odd job. 
uh, Toru Tanaka, all these people who are Hawaiian and then ended up being portrayed as the s- sneaky, devious Japanese uh, characters. Uh, what was mes- Mr. Fuji's original character when he was into wrestling? Uh, was it was it what we uh, sort of grew to knew? No, knew, no, you know what I'm saying? Or did he have a new character, uh, you know, initial character before he developed into the traditional Japanese wrestling character? No, he, he was... Uh... He's he still well in, in Hawaii. He was just a solid uh, preliminary guy, preliminary wrestler. Then, then when he went on the road, the floor he took on that whole uh, that whole Japanese or the, you know the, uh, the the December seventh. I don't all the all the great uh, until until recently until maybe the seventies. All the great uh, all the good all the noted uh, Japanese wrestlers were uh, for all from Hawaii. Kenji Shibuya, Fuji, Elgar, uh, you know, uh, Tanaka, all of Mr. Moto. I think the original uh, Mr. Moto was the original, uh, you know, hated the Japanese, uh, Japanese guy. Uh, you know, they're all from Hawaii. Yeah. Fuji didn't know, he didn't know any Japanese. <laughs> Do you remember, because he was obviously a really great at what he did. Do you remember the first time he was stabbed? Food? Yeah, he says he was stabbed three times. Oh no, no, I no, I don't. Uh, well, well, as what? Uh... I don't know. Uh, I, I wish I'd done more research on this thing. I was hoping you'd know more, but <laughs> he, he no, basically said I, he'd I, been I stabbed. Didn't know Wrestling or bar fights? Uh, I, don't or bar fights. <laughs> I don't think he differentiated. I don't think he differentiated himself. You know, I was actually going to ask you though, because I was hoping this would lead on to the next question: is what was the worst weapon a fan ever went at you with, or what was like the most dangerous situation that you found yourself in in with uh, angry fans? Oh, bolts and you know, just the thing throwing things at you know. A lot of guys. Uh... One night, not me particular, but the group in Florida, we had a, we had a, in fact, it was actually the John Donfall, Joe LaDuke, but we, uh, King Curtis, myself, Joe LaDuke, Masao Hattori, who was a manager, and I think Saido, we got in the, in Joe's, he called it the, uh, the spaceship, the Joe's, we got in oh, somebody's van anyway, and some guy was outside in the window, or, you know, in the, the car, and he opens his coat and he flashes. He flashes a knife and Joe, everybody, you know, Joe opened the door and he was left-handed anyway. And he, boom, and it sounded like, you know, like uh, somebody smashing a cricket ball over the, out, out of the park. I was just, boom, and everybody's getting ready to stand up and, you know, and, and then they heard him and the guy just folded and fell into a, into a puddle of water, started to drown, you know, and I guess, you know, so we made it to, uh, I was Fort Myers, I remember. Fort Myers, we made it up the road about 30 miles to Punta Gorda, the next city on the way back to Tampa, going home after the masses. And it was 30 miles, and Curtis goes, well, there's no police cars. We haven't stopped. He, he's still alive. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to make it. So, yeah. That was, but I, I was never, you know, accosted uh, with any knives or guns, luckily. I know Bobby Heenan got shot at a couple of times. A lot of guys, Piper got stabbed in North Carolina once, but uh, I'd never, you know, guys wanted to fight and stuff, you know, always wanted, you know, not always, but, you know, there would be the, you know, momentary or occasional, you know, somebody that wanted to take it or passed. Were you, um, were you somebody who fans would occasionally run into the ring and try and attack from behind or were you, uh, so, uh, let's say uh, scary enough that they wouldn't bother trying you and try on someone less scary. No, I got uh, a few times. You know, people would come out. You know, things are going, things got hot. I uh, I caught a beer bottle across the head once, and uh, um, I remember in Orlando, I was the heel and Killer Carl Cox and a couple other guys, and they. Orlando, they used to, in Orlando, Florida, they used to charge the ring a lot. And we were, being a heel, you're, you know, you're kind of afraid to, you know, you're hesitant to, in front of a big crowd, to start picking people off the side of the ring. You know, that's an instant, but uh, Carl Cox was a baby face, believe it or not. And I was the heel, and he did, uh, 
he did all the work. He did all, he picked all the, he picked all the guys off the apron. So it was, you know, occasionally we'd get somebody, you know, and tear his clothes off or something. But, I mean, it, it was just, you know, you're just looking for trouble if you want to, you know, sometimes once I was tired and punched the guy and that cost me a bunch of money. He actually he walked behind the screen and he actually didn't cost me, it cost the office. And he hit me and I hit him back and that was it. I, was, I shouldn't have hit him back. When was this? Was this in the WWF? Because I thought in the territory days yeah. that, that was just, they had it coming. WWF. Up and do it. I was just standing by. And the guy was, you know, he was, he was kind of goofy anyway. <laughs> so I just something I said, oh, yeah, come on. You know, he, he ran back and hit me and I just <laughs> hit him back, split his lip. Uh, got in all kinds of trouble. That's the problem with a national yeah, company. Really office. Being in a national yeah, company, office. that's probably the problem. With uh, it's it makes you more visible to lawsuits, I suppose. Yeah. Going back onto Mr. Fuji, and probably I'd probably say his most famous tag team partner was Toru Tanaka. Uh, any memories of him? I know he went on to be an actor later on. He was in the last action hero, and oh, what was the other one when he was in? He was in uh, the Running Man as well. But uh, what do you remember of uh, Toru Tanaka? He did a lot of movies. He, he got out of. Uh... He was an impressive looking dude. He was no oh, barely six feet high, but he was close to six feet wide and six feet thick. He wasn't, and he was, uh, you know, not a fat guy, you know, first naturally when he was, he was young and uh, he was really, uh, yeah, he was really impressive. He would, uh, that's another guy. Fuji would try and try and rip, but it, it would always backfire on him. <laughs> you know, you know Fuji's always in there. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's go, come on, come on, come on, come on. And he's always in a hurry. Always, you know, always. So he'd get into the restaurant, you know, is I want my, you know, this is the, you know, in the United States and the, on the mainland, we call it. But, you know, your soup comes with the, I want my soup boiling hot. I always, he always wanted his soup and the order and the menu and, you know, get the food running. And, and Tanaka would sit there with the menu and look at, ah, oh, I'm not hungry. I don't. And, and just about when I, as everybody's finished, he go. Well, I think I'll let me, let me. I'll try. Let me try this. <laughs> and he'd order a whole meal. And, and, and uh, Fuji got out of his mind. And I just oh god. <laughs> and, you know, and Fuji, he was always going a different direction. He was, you know, he was kind of incoherent at times. And Charlie, you know, and, and um, Fuji would rib him, you know. But uh, you know, it, it'd get back. It would just t- just turn around on him. You know, it always it came back on him. <laughs> I mean, he did. He, he tight. He did. Tanaka would fall asleep on the uh, on the on the ring in the in the interview sessions in Hamburg and Allentown, and he'd fall asleep on the apron of the ring. So Fuji uh, taped a newspaper to his foot and set the newspaper on fire. <laughs> Stuff like you know, just 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 your everyday. You know, I mean, it's a big newspaper. So, you know, it's just a big flame going off. You know. <laughs> so it's like a broadsheet rather than a tabloid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, He's a fun-loving guy. In uh, Fred Blassie's book, and I'm actually going to quote something to you, he describes Tanaka as being the ring general and the more professional of the two, while Fuji was the more uncontrollable in the ring. So this is the quote. Uh, So in addition to worrying about their opponents, Tanaka had the responsibility of making sure that Fuji didn't get out of hand. So was Fuji not that interested in the matches? And, you know, that's why he was a tag team wrestler and Tanaka was like, no, now you do this, now you do this. And he was sort of directing traffic. No, the other way around. Oh, really? Well, yeah, Fuji was a ring general. Yes, yes, Fuji left. Fuji, he, you know, he had, a, he, had a, he had a tremendous mind for 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 wrestling and for the business. You know, yeah, yeah Fuji was the Fuji was a general. You know, he he may act, you know, he may act a fool, but he said certainly well. You know, he could he could take care of himself too. Right, you know, he, he was a. Uh, I'm uh, I'm gonna have to ask this. The legend of the dog rib. Which are the ones that Wait. you've heard? And um, I've got so many names here. I've got Skandar Akbar. These were the victims, apparently. Skandar Akbar, Billy White, Wolf, uh, Roddy Pipe said this happened to Toru Tanaka, and Hulk Hogan said it happened to Torquemata as well, where pets went mysteriously missing and then got served to them at a later date. I was uh, going back to those uh, those early sixty days. I was a young boy at Dean's Gym for the Billy White with Beauregard uh, 
Beauregard session where I was there next to Dean's. There was a little uh, local type type bar uh, downtown where I had to go. You know, the Morocco go get the ice and I ice down the beer. And, you know, don't eat. We got the you know we're making uh, we're making barbecue for White Wolf and. And uh, Beauregard, don't don't eat. No, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't eat anything anyway. But you know, I was in. I was young. Those guys are all drinking. Yeah, you know. I, but yeah, I was. I was. I, I put. I, I chilled the beer for that one. They, those guys, they were. Blah, 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 blah. Come on, eat, 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 eat. You know, you know, Fuji, Fuji. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, <laughs> eat, 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 eat. You know, and it was. You know, it just yeah. Then he brings the heads of the dogs. His friend lived in the. Behind his house had a big, uh, big field. We're going up to the mountain up in Cocoa Head there, and all the wild dogs and stuff from the back, and he'd shoot them. And he was a hunter and stuff, and skin them, and and uh, you know, and then they teriyaki them, and <laughs> the lunch is served. <laughs> the other ones I don't know about the pets. I wasn't there. Like I said, I heard Hillbilly Jim's story about somebody, you know, about another guy in Tennessee. So you know. It happened once that, that I know of, so I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute it not happening again. No, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be in awe. So, the, so you, you're aware of the Billy White Wolf one. What had he done? Do you remember what this was in sort of, of a receipt in? They were, they just like you know, they, they didn't, they didn't, they were real tight to the vest. They didn't like to spend money. And uh, lived in Waikiki, you know, and they would uh, go to the happy hour at the hotel and eat, and, you know, supposed to dinner and, you know, instead of, you know, instead of living well. And, you know, Fuji was always, always about uh, living well, all about, you know, living good and, you know, and being in style and stuff, you know, you know, you know style, style in it. So, yeah, he was, uh, so if they're a little tight, tight in the, you know, a little tight in the pocket, you know, that, that uh, that, that kind of wound up, wound Fuji up. <laughs> Did he like cook regularly, or was it like I'm cooking today and then he everyone knew? He was a hell of a cook. You know, you'd, be, you'd have to be there from the start of the meal. You know, the start of the preparation. <laughs> well, you see, you know, you'd always do the, the, you know, the, 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 the story about the tuna fish sandwiches with the cat food. And, all true, you know, you know. Who was it? Atlas used to steal his, his tuna fish sandwiches, and he and he'd, uh, he substituted with cat food. I used to feed the midgets, uh, feed the midgets tuna sandwiches too. Uh, you know, he would do. This. <laughs> I've got to ask this one because I think you might have mentioned it in your Hall of Fame speech. It was a snowstorm where Fuji was driving, and oh. yeah, you've got to tell us the story. Erie, Pennsylvania. We're down. They we used to go three or four days to. We would uh, hub out of Pittsburgh, stay in, stay in Pittsburgh there. So Erie, Erie, Pennsylvania is 120, 150 miles some north of Pittsburgh, and um, God, it's a miserable, cold, cold place in Pittsburgh. You know, from Pittsburgh, and you go a couple hundred miles north, and you and it's a straight shot, all freeway. And Fuji did not like. He didn't like to drive. Couldn't drive in the snow, hated the snow, hated the, so um, we're coming back and it's, it's freezing cold, too cold to be drinking beer. So we can grab a bottle of cognac and, um, <clears throat> you know, he two or three shots and he's driving down, looking, going, talking. I'm looking at, at the speedometer and I was, oh, pretty good. You're doing about 45, 50, 90, you know, which is good for him. In the snow and stuff, because you know, and it was and it was horrible outside anyway. And I said, "Oh, you, you know, you're driving normal." I said, "It's terrific." Oh yeah, you. Yeah. Next thing I look over, you're about sixty-five. So, you know, next thing, you're spinning down the road, slamming on the brake. Oh, there's nobody around. You know, the, the, we're on a, on a major highway. You know, he's so he's going 70, 80 miles an hour down the, you know, in a, in a snowstorm. It was just oh god. The sheik was in the back, and he, his head would pop up, and he'd look, and it would pop back down. Oh God! Yeah, that was. Uh, would uh, Would Iron Cheek dare say anything to Fuji, <laughs> just in, 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 unless like Ian Kerr is driving like that. Yeah, <laughs> he was behind the wheel, and he had the acc accelerator on his foot. We were pretty much at, at you know at his mercy. 
<laughs> right, I've got a list. I did a bit of research, and obviously there's a few compilation articles of like Mr. Fuji's greatest hits as a rib. So I'll throw a few words out there and see if any of them maybe jogs some memories of uh, some of his classic ribs. And the first one is, of course, laxatives. That one, I saw his son, uh, his son or son-in-law put on the thing that, uh, I don't know if it's, it's true, if he's the one that horseshoe flied, uh, horseshoe, horse flied uh, Haystacks Calhoun or not. But that's a, that's a, that's a legendary story from uh, Hawaii. Calhoun, Calhoun would talk, you know, he talk up a state neighbor, you know. You know, and he was kind of like he was. He thought he was like a a big tough guy instead of a big fat guy. You know, and anyway, they they didn't like him, so they they gave him the lax. He was going to Japan. I guess uh, you know this is you know pre seven forty seven, sixty seven, eighty seven, ninety seven, whatever it is. Now it's you know in back in the the old days they didn't have the big even the big plane. So these guys, they were going over, uh, I don't know who, uh, who it was. They, Fuji gets credit for, but they horseshoed, uh, horse fly haystacks. And, uh, you know, whatever he was on a shoot, four or 500 pounds, he couldn't fit in the bathroom. So he's, you know, he had the runs and he's going, he had to go back. But evidently they had to hold a, hold a, a, a big blanket behind him. And he, he, he took a dump into the, into the, uh, into a mailbag at the back of the plane. <laughs> I guess you can hear it all, <laughs> all over the place. You know, just very humiliating experience. Luckily, I never had to go through something with something like that. But, I hope it yeah, was I, I don't know if that was actually Fuji or Valentine or Buddy Rogers, but that, it was coming out of Hawaii anyway, because a lot of them, a lot of the flights to Tokyo stopped in Honolulu. And a lot of the wrestlers used to stop going and coming. That, that's how... Ed Francis built up his territory so massively in those days. Guys coming back and forth from Australia and uh, Japan. Uh, the next one I've got to say, and you actually mentioned this when I last interviewed, who was uh, Outback Jack's drinks. Now, I've actually heard Brian Blair, I think it was Brian Blair, or, uh, yeah, it was Brian Blair, who said that it was Dynamite who was slipping illicit substances into Outback's drink, but you said it was Mr. Fuji. Well, I don't know if Dynamite came there later. I don't know if Dynamite, but the, I, I, like I said in the story, documented in the story before, the Sheik and I, there was a, a chain Mexican restaurant, chain of Mexican, you know, chain, uh, I forget what the name of it was, but it was, a, you know, a mile or two away from the Holiday Inn where we're staying. And, um, you know, we're showered and changed and, and headed out, getting a taxi and going through the lobby there and they had a, the hotel bar downstairs little tropical type setting in the thing and he's doing oh come 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 uh, the, the brother the brother over here he like drink uh, he, uh, he can really suck him up he really suck him up really good he's a guy that, and I, I back yeah yeah mate he says uh, yeah you uh, you american blokes you you fellow you don't you don't like to drink too much do you oh boy here it comes you know it's, it's so I was Fuji says, oh, you, know, you, you, you get the, the, the medicine, the, the, you know, the, the brother, he having a hard time sleep, hard time, hard time sleep with a brother here. I don't think he actually slept them to him. I think he actually actually gave the H-bombs to, to you know, and, and uh, Jack, but I'm, I'm sure Dynamite and those guys just slip them to him all the time. You know, they did everything, they, they tortured poor Jack. But uh, I, I'm sure, I think Fuji just gave them to the, so the Sheik and I, we take off, we, we go and, you know, have the, the Mexican meal, a couple of beers, whatever. And we're, and we got the, we're coming back in the taxi to the hotel. And they're surrounded by blue lights and just beep, 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 beep all over the place, all flashing. What the hell went on? So we go in, you know, a good idea, you know, that Fuji struck again. So we walked in and the cops were there. You guys said, you know, obviously with the sheik there, you know, those big, good sized guys. He says, oh, you, you guys wrestlers? He says, uh, this out this this other wrestler he's, he's come back down he's he's walking around the hotel looking he's you know he's in a, in a trance and i he was i guess he got him drunk must have been three shots house yeah, on the whole nine yards and he, was, he says yeah he's, he's and i said so, here he comes not a stitch of clothes not just Mick as a jaybird from walking down the you know walking down the thing and he's you know he's ah get out of my way you know, and, uh, and he's 
slurring, and then I just, you, you, you don't know who you're fooling with. And you know, surrounded by cops, and then it's like, come on, brother, let's go. Let's, you know, they're, you know, they're gonna let him go. Everything's, you know, he's <laughs> no, nobody's gonna rush to wrestle him to the ground anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he's completely nude. So I said, get him, you know, we come on, brother, let's go, let's go. What room is he in? So he got that, give me a key, and I. I get it. I said, he can't, uh, no, you can't lock him in the room. I said, well, let's hope you know, get him, get him back to bed. And, oh, God. And Mulligan, Jack, Black Jack Mulligan tells the story. He was checking out. He said, what happened last night? He said, the, the dog Black Jack was naked walking around, walking around the, the, the hotel here. <laughs> he said, he was only there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the FBI uh, yeah, story. I was there. There's um, there's a, there's so many I've I've actually written just to, like bring up names. I might have to skip through a few of them. So one of them was um, uh, indirect. Uh, sorry, uh, incorrect directions on cars, uh, where he just make people drive around in circles and circles and circles just for his own amusement. Um, one of them, and you brought this up also with the Hall of Fame speech, and I've got to ask you about this. You mentioned that you used to shave one eyebrow or half a mustache. But then you also add, and this is a quote, his barbary was not only limited to facial hair. Oh, yeah. He'd pull your pants, he'd pull your pants right down. <laughs> Men, women, I don't know. I, I was never, actually, I was never present for any of those, uh, never present for those events. I've, you know, viewed a few, viewed a few results, but, you know, you know, he was... Uh, was it just half? He was busy. He was busy, Fuji. You know, he was. Uh, he had a lot. To, uh, yeah. So we've got also uh, gluing slash nailing people's stuff to the ceiling, uh, cancelling flights, padlocks on clothes and luggage. But this one's a really famous one, and I imagine you probably heard this secondhand when he took out the car engine from Bobby Eaton's car. Yeah, well, I was. That was in Tennessee, I suppose. I wasn't there, but you know, I. I he did to SD Jones. He um, took the M80s and got it under the hood and put them uh, put them where the ignition the ignition goes. So when SD went to the boom, you know, the big those big fire the big big red firecrackers, <laughs> all, all the smoke and stuff comes out coming out of the hood. And he's, what the hell? Would you just uh, M80 is is ignition? Who got Mr. Fuji though? He was got a couple of times, I know that. Uh Dudley Clements, Sir Dudley Clements, uh, was in Tennessee, he was a manager. Died soon after Fuji left there in a in a car accident. He was a manager and I think he was I, I think he was an Englishman also. But he and Fuji were real jam up. They're really they're really tight. And uh might have been his one of his dogs. They got eaten early. I'm not sure, but uh, anyway, the, he uh, he helped Fuji pack. Fuji was leaving Tennessee, going to San Francisco to work for Roy Shires, where I was at. So he helped Fuji pack his uh, U-Haul to drive. He drove, you know, wrestlers drove across country stuff in those days with their family. Fuji had the had the U-Haul all loaded and everything else. And just as they were closing it, uh, Clements said, "Gives a big fish and throws it inside." And puts it in a box or you know somewhere stashed it in the u-haul and shut the u-haul and locked the gate locked the door and you know three four days later in san francisco you know by the time there was ripe he got by the time he got to hayward there in california from tennessee i imagine probably during the summertime that he drove so if it was a winter time it wouldn't have been you know a big uh, a, a big thing but i so i imagine i imagine it was during the summertime that he would uh, open it up and smell like hell. Uh, I um I read one apparently from Lonnie Maine, uh, Moon Dog Maine. Any chance would you ever hear that story? With him and Lonnie Maine? Yeah, they were good friends. They did a lot of the Bob, Bobby Jaggers, Cowboy Bobby Jaggers. They used to uh, they used to torment him. I was in Hay. They li all lived around Hayward. That's when I was living down in Santa Cruz, and luckily I was away from all that, uh, all that happiness over there. But they used to take 
And Bob, Bobby J, he's a, Bobby Jagger's is nothing. It's like me. I, he knew he knew all the story, Luther's story that he wasn't there, and you know he he, he was a nice guy, he was a good guy, but he had all the stories, all the you know, oh this happened here, and this guy did that, and like he was there. So you know, it, it, eventually you know he got he got on the Fuji's nerves, or and uh, they said anyway they take him. They all lived in Hayward together. So I think it was Von Steigers, Lonnie. Uh, Another Englishman, uh, uh, Johnny. Uh, he, he wrestled, but they all they, and they they go to they, after the matches. They'd all get together and they get Jagger's just drunker than a skunk, and, and they, they they turn him loose. I, at one time, I guess he had a Corvette, and they, they got him all all whiskeyed out, and then the, turned him loose in his car, and they painted his windshield, the, it, all 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 the glass in his car. They painted it all black. He took any of his, uh, they, they did all kinds of stuff to the poor guy. And, uh, you know, there was, you know, they, they just, you know, here, drink, you know, you know, food, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, have, have, have another, he loved it. He was a, he was a wonderful host. If he, you know, if he wanted to get you, uh, wanted to get you inebriated. Was it a Johnny Berend? Was that the name? No, no. Uh, Johnny Eagle. Johnny Eagle. Johnny Eagle. Johnny Brand was, he was a big star. He was the big star here in Hawaii for the longest time. And uh, good guy. His wife's still around, lives with uh, Don Lewins. Don Lewins, where Don Lewins' house was the old uh, Lewin brothers. In fact, I was watching, just watched uh, Says Iwo Jima last night. And the old Don, Don passed away and we went to his, uh, they had a service for him at Kaneo Marine Base. And they buried, they had, uh, Put his name on the on the stone. He was one of the he was the oldest marine on the island. He was the most senior, and he'd been to uh, he was on he was at Iwo Jima, and he was there. He said the only way he says the only you get if you disobey, I get this you, you disobey an order in wartime. You don't you don't pay that that's grounds for you know and and you're and you're leaving a leaving a battle. You're wounded. You disobey a, a commanding officer's order. That, that's grounds for um immediate uh, dismissal, you know, uh, from the army, but they, the guy ordered him and he disobeyed it, but he was going back into battle as opposed to running out of battle. So that, that was Don Lewin's. <laughs> that was one of Don Lewin's. He was a Marine there on Iwo Jima. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he was wounded, went back to battle and the Lieutenant or captain said, get your ass up, you know, out of here. He said, no, nah, I'm going, I'm going back to the front. So he was, that's, that's, that was, that's the only time. I guess in a war situation or any situation where you can, especially war, a battle situation that you can uh, disregard the, the, the comment, you know, the, of a, you know, a higher up. Yeah. I and not get discharged, basically, dishonorably yeah. discharged. Yeah. Dishonorable discharge. Yeah. Uh, I've got to ask Fighting this, I've got to ask this uh, before we move off the ribs, because obviously it's just a huge subject with Fuji was, did he ever get you? Oh yeah, sure. Back and forth. Back, back, he went back and forth. Like 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 Tanaka, a lot of his uh, a lot of his stuff on me would backfire. I'm uh, I left the truck with with him one time when I was I left New York for for a few months and I had a pickup truck. Came back to Hawaii and uh, so he would spare no he would, food would spare no expense. On and I didn't like you know I didn't like shiny things or paintings or, you know, and decorations on my cars or anything. I, I like to keep them simple. So I came back, I got the truck and it was covered. I had big, big lights on the top of it and lights. And I was, the thing was all, all lit, you know, it was, it was like a, was like a Christmas tree going down the road. But it followed me. We were doing that uh, TV in Allentown one time. And the, the it was so, the much fog. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. So they had to follow me back. I, <laughs> I was the guiding light. Through the fog, <laughs> they, had, they had to follow my truck. It's tough to move on the uh, on from the roads with Fuji, but uh, one of his other tag team members, uh, partners, excuse me, was Mr. Saito, and he's most famous mm. for the McDonald's thing, which I will ask you. But what do you what are your memories of Mr. Saito? Good guy. He was uh, from Japan, a Japanese. Uh, I, I when he went to the Olympics, I said he placed, and then somebody correct, corrected me and something. He, he went to. He went to the, the, the Olympics for uh, 
for Japan as an amateur wrestler. He was a good guy. He, he was around, uh, what a, uh, technically, well, most of the Jap Japanese guys are technically just a master, you know, just as, and he worked, and he started with, uh, in the United States, he started with Roy Shires. So he learned the, um, you know, the, 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 the technicality, technicality of the matches and the, and the intricacies of the, of the match. And he, you know, he absorbed, he was a, he was a, he was a smart guy. And a tech. We we'll go back to ribs, though. Mm. We're coming out of uh, coming out of Providence, Rhode Island, one time, and we've you know we always we got the beer and we got the, the you know Chinese restaurant with the Chinese food to eat. You know, and the, while we're driving, you know, from Providence back, we're living in the Hamden, in Connecticut, New Haven. So we're driving back, and Saito's mad as a mad as a wet hand. <laughs> he's always in the back and. Is, well, food, why? Why you blame me? What? what? I know you, you had a lock on his boot. Nice cow, beautiful cowboy boot. Brand new pair, and somebody put a lock on it. So I get, you know, on the, the, the straps to go on the outside. And the, the, the uh, <laughs> so he had to cut, cut the cowboy boot in order to get the lock off. Otherwise, he says, uh, he says, why do you blame me? He says, why do you, says, Fuji, I know you, 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 you always rip. You do this to me before in San Francisco. See? <laughs> Same rib. What he goes, oh, oh, I gotta pay attention. I don't want to cross double my rib. <laughs> so he, you know, he was busted right there. Saito was, was pouting. He wouldn't eat for about an hour. And I, I wasn't hungry, but I was stuffing all the I was, I was stuffing all the food as much as I could, so there wouldn't be anything left for him. I could probably got my I drank, ate so much I couldn't drink. Ah, uh, you know, you get tired, you get bored in the road. You know, you you gotta do stuff to entertain yourself. Do you know? I've got to ask you. I've got to ask you. What did you hear of the McDonald's boulder through the glass and police beating up incident with a uh, uh, Campatera? Just, just uh, pretty much what everybody else did. I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wasn't there, and I know they both did time. They did. Uh, Patera picked up a big bowl that threw it through. I don't even know all the particular. I, I've read uh, read different different accounts of it, so I don't know. And I, I really don't remember. I know the big bowl that went through. But they were he was in uh, they were in Minneapolis, AWA territory at the time. I don't know if it was actually in Minneapolis, but that's that's who they're working out of. And um, I don't I have to check the year, but I don't remember exactly where I was. At, at the time, I have to, you know, corresponding year, I could tell you, but I, I just, I just heard stories about it. I don't know anything. Yeah, you never heard uh, any you know, like prison stories or anything from Saito or even Campatera back in the day. No, just accounts. I just accounts. I've never asked them about it. You know, and you know, they're, uh, you know, Saito just said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> he just, he, he was a. Uh, he was kind of an innocent bystander. And then he started hip tossing guys and chopping guys and cops and everything else. And I guess it wasn't a good scene. Yeah, I, I heard one of the cops was a woman and also the sh a sheriff's daughter. So I think that's probably why yeah. they got such bad sentences. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they were different. yeah all kinds of stories. Uh, I'll, I'll move on from that, and I'll uh, go from uh, Saito to Tiger Chung Lee. He always struck me as a bit of an odd-looking character, and he also went into acting. Uh, and I think his like, name was Kim Duck or something. And the thing that always yeah. sort of stood out for me when I look back on the archive stuff is that he wore boots. He was like the only Japanese or Korean like uh, wrestler who wore boots. Well, yeah, all the guys that came, all the pro wrestlers are broken from Japan. Ended up when these guys are all, all the uh, Tanaka ended up. He had he had bad feet, so he ended up wearing boots. But all the other guys, all the other guys were uh, all barefoot. Uh, Kenji and Fuji and Mitsu and Moto. I don't know what the symbolism is. You know, Japanese guys. I guess you can sneak better if you don't have shoes on. You know, you're sneaky or something. I, I don't know what the what the, what the message is. Uh, Tanaka eventually was wearing boots because he had bad feet. But all the rest of them were, uh, all the rest of them, we have barefooted. Yeah.
imagining it's sort of injuries, but I mean, what do you remember of Fuji going from wrestler to manager? Mm. He was, uh, yeah, he was, he was in the ta- he was in the tags, and the tag champion with with uh, Saido. I left for a few months and came back. Uh, and that's when they put him and I together. I, I my, my after well, I came. Uh, I I was with the Wizard, and then. Uh, then I came with Lou. I don't know how I went from transition from the wizard to Lou. Uh, I don't, well, but when I was involved with the, with the Jimmy Snuka, I was, uh, uh, Lou was my manager. That led to the meatballs and all the other stuff. And Lou was my manager. And then uh, I don't exactly remember how, how I transitioned to Fuji becoming my manager. I guess, you know, I, I, I was no longer champion. I, I always mentioned the guys that, that, you know, the champion, uh, you use a belt as, as your gimmick. That's why Jake the Snake was, you know, wasn't uh, saw that one, you know, needed as a champion because he had a, the snake. You know, all these other, you know, they had their, they had their gimmick and the belt. As soon as you win a belt, what you're going to do with this, lose it. You know that that's uh, that that's why because I was, you know, as a heel, I was, I got beat up a lot, you know, and uh, you know managed to win and managed to keep my belt. You know, so it was it was it was a good foil. So, um, you know, uh, I forget who we were talking about. In the, in the interview. Uh, Fuji as manager. Oh yeah, how I got here? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember exactly the transition, but he got it, and they had him. It was just one day he was there, and then one day he was just you know we were together, and he was he had that top hat and the, you know the the odd job kind of hat and the, and the tuxedo and the cane. And that was, uh, that was it, you know, and uh, it worked well because, you know, it, it, he was, he was my belt, you know, I didn't, with him, I didn't need a chair, you know, and uh, you could use him with the, with the cane or interference or disqualification. Was, did Fuji always have like two different types of cane shots? Was one like for the people he liked and he'd miss them and for the people he didn't quite like as much, he might lay it in a bit harder? I don't know. Yeah, I, I was never on the... I got hit by the cane. He hit me with the cane a bunch of times, salt lots of times, you know. But, but uh, the, the degree, I, I'm not sure. Somebody, I'm sure, you know, somebody he didn't like, he probably swat him. You know? <laughs> Told him to dress like our job. Was it the office, or was it just him? He just turned up one day with a suit on. Yeah, everything came from the office. That, that was that was after Vince Senior was gone, hmm. and uh, Junior was running the. Junior is running the show. So evidently that was their vision for him going on. He was getting on, his knees were bothering him. And he was getting, he, was, he could still perform because we used to, uh, we used to do tags, you know, like me and Albano, but he would, he would participate a lot more actively. In fact, uh, the only time I ever saw Ricky Steamboat mad or, or you know, uh, uh, out of sorts was uh, we had Detroit going really well. We, we built it up. And it was when Steamboat and I were in a, in a single hand. and we were really, you know, we're really super hot and we're going into Joe Louis Arena. And I didn't realize, well, I didn't realize at the time, but uh, instead of being Steamboat going in in a, in a strap match or cage match or something like that, they turned into a tag match with me and Fuji against him and Hulk. So to keep, because, you know, you're going to have a 20,000, 20,000, uh, you know, sell out at Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. So, you know, they had to get the the main man on the card, you know. So, you know, the big, the big, the big, you know, our, our big guy had to get, uh, be, be a, a part of that show, you know. And just to guarantee, to guarantee that it went over the top. But, uh, just, you know, seemed, uh, I, was, I, so I didn't, you know, at that, at that time, a lot of times I didn't realize that I, I realized what was going on. My payoff would be the same. But I already always realized that you know they were, Fuji was getting manager money on, on a lot of things, and but if he'd come in in a tag like that, he would be, we'd be getting you know all all four of us would all be getting main event money and main events. So that's the way I looked at it, you know, and I, and I didn't uh, I didn't look at it somebody else you know stealing jumping in. God knows I jumped in a million of Hulk's houses.
<laughs> so, so, you know, that's, I parachuted a bunch of those and was happy to be there. So, you know, the, him, uh, him getting in there, but, but, you know, it's, it's a, it's a matter of, you know, that we, uh, I sold out Detroit by myself, you know, that was, or, you know, or, you know, or my match, you know, my, my match. That was the only time, uh, the only frustration I ever came across Ricky, that at the time he was, uh, that they was, uh, and then he wasn't angry. It just, you know, it was a bit of frustration, a bit of irony in his, in his voice and that, 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 that had taken place, you know, with you and Mr. Fuji teaming together, I mean, you were more of a team, not in the ring, but in all these segments, and especially on the old TNT show, and I will ask about all of those, of course, but I've got to also Ooh. ask, the TNT show itself, where was it filmed originally? Because it seemed like you were on constantly, and you were <laughs> and you were, all, you were just always on, and I think it was filmed in Baltimore originally. And was this on, yeah. was this on um, Days Off, or was this, uh, you were taken off the road for a day? to participate oh it's a saturday morning on your way to somewhere oh <laughs> everything everything was no days off what's a and then you'd have to you know define what a day off was back in those back in that time that era no they would uh you'd have a you'd have a, a tv shooting you'd you know be there 10 11 o'clock in the morning and we'd uh, you know we'd start with the uh you know what there was a tnt uh like a Johnny Carson or, uh, you know, like a Tonight Tonight Show type. Well, you'd be familiar. Yeah. Like, like a Tonight Show uh, type thing. And they'd, uh, they, 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 they came around. That, that, all that Fuji Vice, Fuji Hospital, Fuji Bandito stuff, that all came up. Uh, Roddy Piper was, uh, you know, and he ended up in Hollywood. And he was, he was an acting aficionado. And uh, I guess he didn't want to do, he didn't want to do a, uh, the soap opera, the um, it's an old search for tomorrow. It was it was like as the as one of the original. So I remember when I was a little tiny kid running around, and my mother or somebody's other mother watching it on black and white TV. So we, you know it had been around forever, and a few years after we did it, it went off the air finally. But it had been around forever. So I guess Piper didn't want to do it. So Vince sent us down, me and Fuji down to do it, and it was a. Uh, we're coming to your town. Uh, I think it was Springfield or something else where the town was located. And, and uh, you know, we're going to the, the main arena and I'm wrestling uh, that night in, in your town. I'm wrestling Hulk for the title, you know, boom, boom, boom. And me and Fuji. And eventually I ended up tearing up the, st you know, the TV studio and Hulk and went back and forth. And we did a week shooting and, and it took about two, three hours. It's amazing how they do those soap operas and they, cut little pieces here and there and they they assemble everything as it goes along we did a week week and a half worth of shows in just a couple of hours oh so it's actually like was sorry so so you do the tnt show and it was like a block you do like a, a, a month's worth of shows basically is what you're saying oh well, not the tnt the tnt was an entire show right i was talking i'm sorry i was going back to the soap opera we oh, go sorry. to the we go and but um but those, those those vignettes, those little those little sketches, they were all they were all filmed. You know, they were filmed and inserted later to uh, you know to accommodate the time, and you know of the of the program. I, I forget it was an hour hour and a half show, but it, you know it was a it was pretty uh, groundbreaking as far as you know wrestling goes. Yeah. Uh, TNT USA Network. So there were certain people at this time. There was sort of the old school professional wrestler and the more modern thinking professional wrestler um i'm not saying either one's right of course uh who some people really hated the segments and the skits and the tnt style accompaniments to the matches and others really embraced it i'm trying to think like someone like george the animal steel really embraced it bruno sammartino really hated that kind of thing where were you mm -hmm. and fuji in that uh, equation as far as these skits and segments hey this was the boss you know it's just it was good, you know. It was it was actually fun doing it. You know, they would. The, uh, we're talking about foods. They never, they they didn't. They never. They never uh, put a script. They they had you know a suggestion. You know, a lines. They had lines. You know, lines for Fuji, but they never they never held them. They never held them to the, to his lines. And uh, Nelson, the guy, the guy's name that that uh, that filmed the, the 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 producer, the director of the show, 
He says, well, we give Mr. Fuji, we give him the script, but we don't, you know, we let whatever, it is, there's one thing, uh, just withstand the, the, the test of time that 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 uh, the Fuji goes, yes, yes, this will withstand the taste of time. <laughs> they, let it, they let it go. You know, they, you know, there was all that stuff was just brilliant. You know, it just it just it just you know, it was natural. It was just, you know, and, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't planned. It wasn't suggested. I, I OK, I remember I, I was back here. My wife, my wife was having a baby. Uh, uh, my wife, my wife was pregnant. In fact, there was my, my daughter put that shot up when I got the two or three girls rubbing me down on the beach and stuff. My old lady sitting at home, nine months pregnant. And all that stuff's going on. They flew Fuji. To, that's when they flew Fuji and Nelson and a camera crew in and they hired the girls from modeling and stuff to, to come down. And and, uh, and that's, that's when he became my manager. At that point, I was going, I was, you know, I was going around, I was doing beach scenes with, with the, with the, the bikini girls and going around and uh, I had some shots of me surfing and stuff. And when that, that's when Fuji was, uh, I don't know if he was managing at the time, anybody uh, with, with the, with the top hat and it before, before I came in, but that's when Fuji and I, uh, that, that's when Fuji and I, it came, comes to mind now, this is, you know, it's kind of a jumble, but that, that's when Fuji and I got hooked up together is that thing and he's what we're going around the island. You know, it's a, well, it wasn't, it's not hot here, but it, at the time it was humid. He's got the tuxedo, and the hat on and stuff, you know. Went to a a, a, a village, a, a temple with the gong and stuff. We did shots over there and we went all, all around the island and me coming back to uh, WWF at the time. And uh, yeah, that, that's where Fuji and I hooked up. That's how, that's where he became my manager. Uh, which of the four? Because I think there were like four main segments, and I had completely never ever heard or seen of Fuji Chan, which is where you are the um, explorer, jealous of the other explorer, and you sh- and you stab him, and it has uh, was it Professor Morocco like initial uh, on the on the thing that was that was probably the funniest one, and Mister Fuji just steals the show. I don't remember it. I, I, God, I drove, I'm a blank. I haven't seen that. And uh, I, I don't remember it. Oh, I I, that's the funniest one. I watched all of them, and then I completely missed Fuji Chant until today, and then I saw it. That's so the funniest well, I gotta, one. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta go through YouTube. <laughs> I, I, we did so much, you know. We were, I mean, we were going all the time there. It's hard to, it's hard to recall. I, I remember we, we. St- what did we start with? Fuji Hospital or Fuji General? It was Fu- Fuji General. I'll give you all four of them. So it was Fuji General, okay. Fuji Vice, Fuji Chan, and Fuji Bandito, where okay. they're in like the little saloon thingy. Fuji Vice was the last one. Yeah. Fuji Fuji Vice was the last one. I remember Bandito and I remember Hospital. I I, um, I draw a blank with Fuji. I remember the Fuji Chan. I, I, it sounds familiar now. Yeah. But I, 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 you know, it's, it's, oh, I don't remember. <laughs> the punchline is you pay Fuji, you're clearly the murderer and you pay Fuji off. And Fuji's looking in the camera going, ha 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 ha, you'll make very good. You make a very good decision. And then it ends. It's so funny. Oh, God. Yeah, we, the, 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 all, the, all the enemies in the Academy Awards are, <laughs> they put them on the back shelf for that. Do you remember? That was, I don't know. It was, uh, you know, it was it was what it was run what was in McMahon's mind. Well, they're all they're all Vince's, you know. And, and, uh, obviously, we were able to to mold and be molded, and and uh, you know, it fell naturally. Well, there's a lot of talent around the W. Bobby Heenan, Piper, uh, Hart, Bret Hart was just a preliminary kid. You know, all the guys. You know, uh, George Steele, Lou Albano. You know. There was a, it just had a, um, the chief, all the talent, Adrian and Adrian and, uh, and Dick Murdoch. And, and, you know, there was so much talent around. Only, you know, everybody was like a natural clown, you know, and every, you know, everybody had a sense of humor. And, uh, and Vince was able to, you know, compartmentalize all the individuals and, and uh, come up with the characters and stuff for everybody or, you know, a, a, a vignette that they could, uh, could perform in. He did it for us. 
I um, in a couple of the skits, you've got to give me a couple of opinions on Freddie Blassie, who turns up, and the fabulous Moolah, who both turn up in two of them. Both you're gonna to have to watch Fuji Chan again so you can see it. But they're also in Fuji Bandito. <laughs> were they? Was it you who was always requesting those two to turn up in them, or were they just? Here you go. No, Moolah's always my girlfriend for everything. <laughs> they're and I just, <laughs> and they're they're millions of millions. In fact. Yeah, Mula was always my love interest for some reason. Well, she was, you know, she was, you know, she was Mula. You know, everybody looked at her, you know, the Bobby Heenan jokes and, you know, <laughs> and, you know about Mula and all the, you know, it's, oh, God. But, yeah, she was always, uh, for some reason, I guess, you know, Vince, I'm sure as Vince was in the back room chuckling, you know, but Mula was always my love interest in all those, not not by, re by request, but... Uh, did you you saw I'm not sure with what I or I uh, taught everybody how to how to take a proper suntan? I didn't the, see that one. Two, I, I saw so many. Uh, I saw you they, doing the stand-up comedy. Two, two twins from uh, the old penthouse magazine. And they're nice looking girls, big, you know, things. And um I got down there, me and Fuji and Vince had this big table, you know, like a massage table set up, and you know, you, you people are, you know condescendingly you, know, you people are so stupid i'm gonna teach you how to how to take a proper suntan but which wasn't a bad idea and he had the two uh the twin uh the twin twin centerfold girls rubbing the oil on me which would have been great he even had them massaging my feet which would have been wonderful if it hadn't had been fuji holding the bottle of, of baby oil which you know completely you know ruined my my experience you know because i'm I'm laying on my back and <laughs> okay, you can stop now. You know, I'm just this puddle. And there was no shower in that Baltimore studio either. So this is just, 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 I'm just covered with oil. I'm covered with baby oil. It's just, a, you know, just to be a puddle of baby oil on my back. And these two uh, twin centerfolds that you have to come in and rub the oil all over me and rub on, you know, and, on my feet, you know, and I got out of that thing. I, I was just all day long. I was just wiping myself down. I couldn't, you know, I was just soaked with oil. I said, oh God. Yeah, that's a, it, it's funnier on the inside. <laughs> it wasn't funny, but I'm just, you know, I'm just biting my tongue the whole time while he's emptying, you know. It was a big, you know, it wasn't an economy bottle of baby oil. It was one of those big, you know, 16, 32 ounce bottles. And then we used all but probably that much of it. Yes. I've um I've got to ask you two I've got to ask you about two more segments the stand up comedy thing because oh I who wrote those jokes for starters you you couldn't get through a single sentence without like flubbing one line <laughs> which was really funny and then Fuji started well, that, interrupting and he couldn't and you couldn't understand what he was saying I, well, it was so fast the, the idea the worst the idea the, the whole segment was the worst the better the, the you know was, I I'd come down. And that was following Fuji Vice. So he, we'd come out on the um, the TNT show, and, and I announced that you know I've done everything. You know I've, I've taken over movies. I've taken over television. I can do this. You saw me act on that. You saw us act. You saw us performing here on Fuji this and Fuji that. I said I can I can do anything. So I, I can do I can do a stand up monologue, which is the hardest thing to do. And then, you know, these are all, this, this is natural. This is all these lines are fed to me. And I, it wasn't uh, my own. So, but I can do stand up. I can do, you know, the, the Johnny Carson better than Johnny Carson can. So that was, that was a preamble to that kind of thing. So the, the, the philosophy behind that is that I, I didn't, I had no, I had no, no clue what the monologue was to begin with. Not, not a, and they put it on, on the TV when the TV used to have the, the, uh, the the wording the words used to run, run yeah the auto cue yeah the cues and they ran it I'm reading and and they and I never saw it before and they're running it so fast that I'm I'm, 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 going to, I'm reading it <laughs> and going, I'm thinking, I saw it again recently that the uh, only thing I remember is something saying something about Imelda Marcos I, I don't remember any of that monologue at all I was just they were just running it I'm just and and Milda Marcus in the chamber of the show, but shoot, and I'm going as fast as I can, trying to keep up with the prompter and, and, and trying to, 
and they're coming with the rim shots with the horrible jokes and stuff. And I'm there, I, you know, and I, I'm like you said, I'm flubbing every line, but I'm just, I'm just trying to keep up with the teleprompter. It's just, you know, it's, and then, you know, <laughs> the worse the better. So, you know, as far as, as far as Vince is concerned, that was a five star, that was a five star performance. I don't think, I don't think I got any card calls from Johnny Carson after that or any NBC or any networks, anything to, to, to co-host any, any talk shows, but after that performance, but the, that was, that was what they had in mind, believe it or not. Oh, no, I totally believe it. I, I saw the acting performances first and then I saw that. In different ways to humiliate ourselves, yeah. <laughs> It's probably why you invited back so many times. You were so good at doing it. You just like you were game for a laugh and up to <laughs> yeah, up for anything. Yeah, I used to be humiliated. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to ask this, and it's the last thing I'll ask in this thing, and they'll ask a few more questions, and we'll sort of wrap it up for the day. But Fuji Vice is the most famous one. Where was it filmed? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I've got to mention this as well. So you, you're on the boat, right? And like you're on the drug boat, or it's meant to be a drug boat. And I'm looking at it, thinking this is. This is the most Mickey Mouse boat. It looks like a fishing boat that you're on instead of like a like a Miami drug boat. And then there's like a wide shot where it's coming down the sea, and then and the boat's called the Angler. I was like, all right, okay, then. So it was a fishing boat after all, then. I don't know what it was. It just I was in Hawaii. I was on vacation in Hawaii. I, I think I came back, come back for something, and um, they Vince, they called me. The office called me. And says, you got to come back a couple of days. Vince has got this idea about another, uh, another, another, another Fuji episode he wants to film, and um, we, we changed your flights. I had my wife and two kids with me, I think, at the time. And, and um, are you guys from inside the boat? Yeah. Oh, they were in the boat. So I had my wife. So they picked. They changed my flight. I was going back to Newark because I was living in Jersey. So they changed my flights to Baltimore, back to Baltimore. I had a a limo wait, waiting there picked me and the, my, my family up, took us to uh, Ocean City, Maryland, where we were filming. Where we were filming that. And they took me right to a nightclub that, that Vince had, that was evidently closed for the night or Vince had bought the whole, uh, the whole nightclub for the night. So they took me, dropped my family off at the hotel, stay in the car. We're going, we're going here to film. So I, we, in we go to the nightclub, uh, this nightclub and they give me, you know, the, that was it, you know, the lines, the camera action, that was, you know, that was it. That was the start of Fuji Vice. <laughs> then the other scenes that they were compiled together that they had, but it started, uh, I just, I got off the plane in Baltimore, the, took the limo to uh, Ocean City, got my family off of whatever hotel we were at, you know, and then I went straight to the nightclub and we started filming. But, but, Eight, nine, ten at night, and worked worked into the into the morning, and and then started again a couple next next day or so. Did you um? Did you trip. think at any point that it was actually going to be good, or was it always meant to just be absolutely terrible and you knew it? Oh yeah, it was. Uh, well, yeah, I had you know the way Fuji used to murder the English language. <laughs> you know, you, you you knew you knew there was no. Uh, the, the, there's no Jack Nicholson coming out of me there, you know. <laughs> so, you know, which Fuji uh, was stay withstanding the taste of time, and the, you know the different uh, the way he he would murder murder the English language. Yeah, it was meant to, it was meant to, as a, as a parody. As a, yeah. So later in Fuji's life, so we'll sort of skip beyond wrestling because I think you left WWF in 1988. And I don't know how much you kept in contact with Fuji after the business, but he ended up working in a cinema uh, later in his life. Um, what do you remember, sort of after wrestling, or like how close were you after? We we would talk on the phone. I went. He was running some shows in Tennessee, and had a, a wrestling school for a while. So my wife was with a um, travel agency at the time, and. Um, used to give me tickets and stuff. So I, I, I went back. I, I did a show for food, a couple of shows, I think, for food. The first thing he did was grab me and take me to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> you know, there was a Chinese restaurant, a Korean restaurant over here. And the food, I just came from Hawaii. Yes. <laughs> you know, Koreans and Chinese people all over the place. As I eat Chinese food for lunch. You know, it's not, you know, it's not a, oh, no, no, come on, come on, come on, come on. We go over there. We go over here, a Chinese buffet, like a Korean, you know, it was, he was running, always running everybody in and out of restaurants all the time. 
Oh, you know, I always run into a Chinese restaurant. The demolition will tell you the same thing. He was always running them to Chinese restaurants. Was he paying? Half the time, yeah. Oh, yeah, food you who'd you spend? Yeah, he was uh yeah, he was he wasn't uh he wasn't tight at all. And uh, I'll take you to the Hall of Fame ceremony, and of course you gave the speech. Uh do you remember what it was like that day? Uh he was laid back. Well, you know, Fuji didn't care. And he was he was just showing up, you know, and uh doing his thing, having, you know, he was he's kinda I didn't realize he fell asleep. <laughs> he fell asleep on stage. He fell asleep during a presentation. And he, he oh, 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 why do you wake me up? Why do you wake me up? <laughs> and then you're resting so peacefully. I didn't want to bother you. He's, oh, yeah, he, he fell asleep during the presentation. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was really excited, <laughs> nervous. You only gave a three-minute speech. I mean, how quickly could have fallen asleep? Oh, this was during the whole presentation. During the while we were while we were sitting there waiting uh, ah. for our turn. I guess they paid. I think they even panned it one time. They had him. You know, he, was, he was nodding out over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, he was on edge. <laughs> Right, I'm going to ask you a few uh, sort of like uh, not quick fire questions, but a few random foodie questions, and then we're going to lock this uh, lock this podcast down. The very first one, and uh, the first one is: Did you have any trouble understanding what the heck he was saying sometimes? Because his accent, I couldn't, oh, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't understand what he was saying half the time when he was doing interviews. Well, coming from Hawaii, I had a better grasp. You know, the, the pidgin English. We speak a lot of pidgin English over here, and uh, so he and I, you know, but there were times, you know. There were the, uh, you know, talking about the, the, what's the promo film? The promo, what's the promo film? The promo, promo, promo. He meant porno. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, there were times you know, that I was, uh, I was stuck for an answer when he said something, but yeah. <laughs> uh, where do you rank Fuji on the list of the all time great drinkers in the business? Oh, right up there, you know. No Andre the Giant. Got buzzed a couple of times. Got buzzed in the kind of the Remy you know, the, that time on, on the couple of times on that freeway from Erie, and, and uh, a couple of times. But that wasn't uh, that wasn't the normal. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't a falling down drunk. He was he, he kept pretty you know yeah he, he he could handle. I don't know if he was all time, but you know he was he was good fun. Uh, we'll assume you're in this, but uh, who were his favorite people to work with and who were his favorite people in the business in general? Food? Yeah. Well, I know he, looked, he liked working with Pat. He worked with Pat in San Francisco, Patterson. And then uh, he worked with all the, all the he, had a, he had a run with all the, the previous, uh, oh, up to a point, maybe up to Billy Graham. He would be with Bruno, uh, Pedro. You know, he worked with all the other, uh, the, the former, the old WWF champions. I know he, I know he had a, a shot in the garden with Bruno off of the top of, from his tag. And, you know, other uh, around, he, he was in a lot of single matches. Who, who his favorite were, I don't know, um, who he enjoyed. I, I know he worked a lot with Patterson, uh, Bruno, um, well, Tony Greer, that was the tag guys. Tony Greer, he worked with Tony Greer a lot. You know, he knew uh, Tony and, you know, Tony was always in the tag team and different ones, Rick Martell and Haystacks and a couple other guys. So, yeah, I don't know so who he hated working against. Um, no, nah, nobody. Fuji could take care of himself. Fuji was... Uh, he had a, a one time when he was a preliminary guy over here. Carl Gotch, noted uh, wrestler, shooter from, you know, around. And uh, they had some kind of role in the ring where he, you know, and Fuji was, you know, Fuji wasn't afraid, but Fuji's good friend um, challenged Carl to a fight in the gym, that old Dean's gym. And uh, it wasn't a certain thing to Carl 
Well, it was a certain thing he was going to lose because win or lose, he would end up in the trunk of somebody's car or, you know, fish food or something, you know. So, you know, it wasn't a winning situation. So Carl was wise to walk away, but uh, he wasn't guaranteed a victory either. And if he'd have fought uh, one of those boys from down there, which it was a, they were rugged. He, he food drank with a rugged bunch. He ran with a rugged crowd. And, uh, and he was well respected. I mean, you know, he was. He was a he was a, he was a he was a tough sob, you know. He wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't a girly boy, you know. He was, you know, Fuji was a he was a badass. And I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up with this one question that I've got to ask. So maybe it might be his uh, his best rib that you most fondly remember, or just another story. What's like the best Fuji story that encapsulates everything that Fuji was all about? Oh God, I don't know if it's the best, but it was, it's an unusual one. I was, uh, I was back here in Hawaii for some reason. It was during the time of, uh, the Peter Maivia's, uh, promotion. And I was going through, I think Fuji was coming back. He has daughters from his first wife. Uh, they, they were living here and his, his, his oldest, uh, his first family and Fuji was coming in for something see his daughters or, or, or family death or something and he, he'd come in so uh, I was involved in a program with uh, I was working with uh, Mark Lewin and Kevin Sullivan in the big building in Hawaii in, in Blaisdell Center so uh, he just he just come into town and um, so the, you know the, the, the thing Sullivan and Mark are both in the ring I didn't get these guys out I'm only wrestling one at a time because I know the I said, well, forget this. And I got down, I walked out of the ring, went back to the locker room, and I came back with food. And they'd seen me, and he'd been my manager, and he'd been everything, and the place just, ah, just erupted. You know, and so we, we went in and kicked the heck out of, out of Mark and Kevin and, 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 and left him. We're going out, and everybody's cheering, and we get back to the locker room, and, oh, you know, First time anybody ever cheered for me. <laughs> All those years, those years and years in the business, he'd never, he'd never been, uh, never got that that big pop, you know, that that big, uh, yay, you know, that is, oh, blow my mind. First time anybody ever cheered for me. <laughs> that might be the best story, but I, I, it, it, it hit me pretty funny. I tell you what, that's a that's going to be the perfect title, and we're not going to top that story. So I am going to, on behalf of Don Morocco, thank you very much for watching this very first episode or listening to this very first episode of Don Morocco's magnificent podcast. So for Don, uh, say goodbye. I suppose we're going to throw it to you. Hello, you guys. Thank you for joining. I uh, hope everybody put a little smile to your face, uh, and so I can help. Now you know, recounting uh, the, the exploits of Harry Masa Fujiwara. So and and his uh, his run through the world of professional wrestling. Hope we entertain you. Have a good night, all. And thank you. And the perfect sign of thank you very much for watching. I will catch you next time.